Hey everyone, welcome to our continuing discussion of memory. This time we're talking about spatial memory. I may have mislabeled the chapter on uh, some of the previous videos, so I apologize. We are on chapter 13, uh, learning and memory. So spatial memory is kind of what it sounds like. It's our ability to form a memory about spaces and our ability to navigate effectively within those spaces. Uh, using the terminology your book likes to use, it's kind of a form of relational learning, how things relate to one another. It relies on uh, Tolman's term of a cognitive map. This is a mental representation of locations and attributes of phenomena in their spatial environment. So where are things and what are those things within our environment? This depends upon our hippocampus. Our hippocampus is necessary to form a cognitive map. Though, um, as you might already sort of intuitively understand, we can navigate without the use of a cognitive map with a sort of habit-like strategy. This relies on the use of allocentric cues, so the relationship between us and cues in our environment. So this is navigating via cues, like knowing to turn right at the gas station, the left at the monument. So seeing an object and knowing what sort of response you must make at that moment. We often call this response type learning versus a place type learning, the cognitive map. So a cognitive map is sort of like being able to picture in your environment okay, I know this place is over here, so it's like northwest of where I am now, so here are some routes that I could take to get there. Whereas a um, non-cognitive map strategy, a response type strategy, is really just knowing a route and not really knowing much about the information in space. Just knowing a series of responses that you must make when you see various cues. Oftentimes, learning starts with a more effortful, deliberative cognitive map type strategy where you have to think about where you are in space and where you'd like to go. And with enough repetition, it becomes a more habit-like um, stratum-dependent strategy uh, where you're not really thinking about as much where you are in space, but you're just sort of automatically making decisions about where to go when you see certain things. If you've ever had the experience of getting in your car and driving to a familiar location and not really having much of a memory of the drive, the drive is effortless and doesn't really engage much of your attention, that's because you're relying completely on this stratum-based habit-like learning we're able to sort of just make these decisions about where to go when you see certain cues, sort of a lower road to navigating. So the Morris water maze is a really, really classic experimental approach uh, for studying spatial memory. We talked briefly about this in the methods unit. Remember the big tub of water, opaque water, where the rats have to navigate to a hidden platform? That's the Morris water maze. So subjects are placed in water and need to swim to a hidden platform. They can use cues in the environment to navigate to an appropriate location. Critically, Animals with hippocampal damage can't do this when the starting position changes, right? So if the animals are released from a different location every time, um, they have trouble learning the navigation, right? Because in order to be able to navigate from different points in space, you need a complete cognitive map. You can't just make a response when placed into the pool. It's more complex of a task than that. So if we have a constant start position, the lesion animals can perform normally. Uh, in this way, it's similar to a stimulus response task, meaning that the rats are placed into the water and they can perform a response. Turn right, swim in this direction, and they'll reach the platform. Right? They don't need a cognitive map. They need to only know what to do when they're placed in a given situation. So with the same start position, same goal location, you don't need an intact hippocampus. You don't need a cognitive map. Right? It's just like navigating by using landmarks. They can just make their turn and get there. But with hippocampal damage, uh, that's not possible. Right? You need your hippocampus to form a cognitive map and navigate to that location itself. So here's just sort of um, a different way of looking at the same thing that we were just talking about. So if the animals are started from variable positions, this becomes a relational task where they can use information about the cues in the environment to form a cognitive map, basically where they are in space, and be able to navigate to a point in space based on knowing where they are and how they relate to where that place is. However, if they're given a constant start position, they're always put into the same place, they can instead learn this as a stimulus response task where they know that when they receive the stimulus of being placed into this environment, they must perform the same response, which is just to sort of swim in the same direction to find the platform. In fact, while they are placed in the same location each time, they may initially approach this as a relational task, relying on their hippocampus to know where that location is in space. But after enough trials, they will begin to perform this as a, as a stimulus response task, navigating based only on the response to being placed in the platform. So you can see here on these uh, these graphs, these are the mean latency. So how long does it take the rat to find its place uh, across trials? 
So if the animal is learning, the latency should decrease over trials, right? It should take less time for the rat to navigate to the escape platform. So the variable position task, which is a hippocampus dependent cognitive map type task, we see those lesioned animals don't ever improve. They don't get better at finding their way to the task, whereas the control animals with an intact hippocampus get faster and faster. However, if we have a constant start position, a stimulus response type task, we see that both the lesion and the control animals, so those with the hippocampal lesion and control animals, improve at a similar rate. The lesion animals are a bit slower, but they arrive at the same speed eventually. Um, so you don't need the hippocampus to perform that variety of a task. You can see here are some sort of sample traced paths in the variable start position task, uh, where animals learn eventually over time to navigate smoothly, whereas animals with lesion do not. So while the use of the spatial strategy depends upon the hippocampus, use of response strategy uh, depends upon the basal ganglia, a structure we've talked about a number of times, also known as the striatum. So uh, the response strategy does not depend upon the hippocampus, and in fact, it's kind of the opposite. While a lot of our memory systems work in parallel, and we've uh, we'll talk about that a bit more going forward. Uh, sometimes these systems work in competition. So the more dominant your basal ganglia type strategy is, the worse you tend to be at hippocampus dependent strategies and vice versa. So we see here that uh, caudate nucleus volume is negatively correlated with the number of errors committed, which is to say the larger the caudate nucleus, the fewer errors are committed or the better performance on a uh, response type strategy task. The opposite is true with hippocampal volume. So the greater the hippocampal volume, the greater number of errors that are produced. So in this instance, the um, more dominant uh, memory system can actually interfere and hinder performance on a task that would depend upon the less dominant system. So let's take a little example from everyday life. Let's say that you wake up and it's time to go to class. Uh, this is actually a map of uh, Oxford, Ohio, where I, I did my, uh, my grad school work. So let's, let's say you wake up um, and it's time to go to class, and you get up and you navigate, navigate over to this little building here in McGuffey Hall, and it's, it's time for class. You've made your way there successfully. It doesn't matter which type of strategy you're using. If you're using a place strategy, you can say, I know what, where that place is in my environment. I know where I am. I can use my relational strategy to find my way to where I'm trying to go. Or if you're using a more allocentric response type strategy, you can say, I know what response returns to make. I'm in a familiar location. I'm taking a familiar route. I can get there based on those cues. Let's say, uh, by contrast, you have a wild night out and you have, uh, you have too many ice cream sundaes and you wake up feeling like this, um, a little disoriented and you're in a new place, a place that you didn't expect to wake up, but you've got to get to class. So let's say that you uh, typically rely on a hippocampus dependent strategy. You're really good at using your cognitive maps. You can employ your place strategy to say, I know where that place is in my environment. You can pick yourself up from this new location over here, and you can formulate a new strategy. Okay, I need to go, you know, sort of northeast. I can take this road, then that road. That'll get me there. Easy, right? Now, let's say you don't have a very good cognitive map, and you prefer to navigate via your response strategy. You wake up at a new place. You might say, I don't know what responses or turns to make to get there. There's no familiar landmarks. I can't just follow the same old route. I'm going to have a lot of trouble getting there, right? So your route might be much more circuitous and efficient. You wander around until you happen upon a cue that you recognize. Oh, okay, I, I usually see this on my way in. I'm on the right track. I can go this way. Okay, that's it for our little diversion into spatial learning. We'll see you next time.